Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to talk about a phenomenon in quantum mechanics known as internal conversion. And before we get into the mechanics of how internal conversion works, I want to first define what it is. Okay, so it's a radiationless transition between states where we have the same spin quantum number. Okay, so we have this big idea that you know, we have this, you know, we have this orbital diagram right here. And each one of these orbitals has two electrons, right? Each one of these orbitals has two electrons. In fact, we can actually sort of uh, tell what these orbitals are. Um, I noticed that this particular orbital right here, it's occupied by electrons. And it's certainly the highest in energy because as we go up, we're increasing in energy, right? And I notice it's the highest one. So it's the highest occupied molecular orbital. So I'm going to call this the HOMO, the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital. And if I go one orbital above that, I notice that it's unoccupied, right? There's nothing in there. And certainly, you know, you could you could go up in energy beyond this and have orbitals up here, but they're still unoccupied. But this one's the lowest, so that makes this one, this one is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital or the LUMO, okay? So that's a really important thing to understand. Now, something can happen. Um, what, what you can essentially do is you can expose, um, you can expose this molecule. In this case, it's formaldehyde. But as we'll see, there are lots of other really important applications in biochemistry to this. But you can basically take this molecule and you can expose it to ultraviolet light. So light in the UV region of the spectrum. Okay, the electromagnetic spectrum. And it turns out that UV light is very energetic. And certainly there are more energetic forms than that, like gamma rays and X-rays and things like that. But for practical purposes in biochemistry, uh, we know that the sun emits lots of UV rays. So the thing that we're most adapted to is UV rays. So for example, if we were to take this molecule formaldehyde and we were to expose it to ultraviolet light, what we may do is we may take, for example, this electron right here and we can excite it into the LUMO. So we can take that electron and move it essentially into the LUMO. And so that electron is seen right here. Now, whenever I expose this molecule to light, and I excite that electron into the higher energy state, it's termed an excited state. It's excited. And so this process right here, this is called excitation. And it's called excitation because I excited that electron from the HOMO into the LUMO. Okay. And also what's important to realize about this is that, um, Number one, notice that between these two states, so between the singlet state and the triplet state, notice that this excited electron right here, I'll do this one in green, they have different spin quantum numbers. Okay, so in the singlet state, the electron that was excited has the same spin quantum number as it was when it was in the ground state. And so the way you typically denote these is with a S, and then there's some number down here, which we'll get to in a few minutes. The triplet state, notice that this electron that got excited is opposite in spin quantum number to the way it started in the ground state. And the way you typically denote the triplet state is you have this T and then you have some number down here. I'll call it M this time just to distinguish it. Okay. So um, both of those electrons, the one in the singlet state and the one in the triplet state, they have different spin quantum numbers. Okay. And you know, I could have, I could have different singlet states. I could have um, an S sub zero, which it turns out is the ground state. I could have an S sub one, which is one of the excited states. I could also have an S sub two, which is also an excited state. So these two right here, these represent different. These are excited. Okay. Whereas the S sub zero, this one is the ground state. And it turns out that if I'm looking at this in terms of increasing energy, it turns out that S sub two is the highest in energy. S sub 1 is intermediate, and the S sub 0, the ground state, is the lowest. So the ground state is always, is always the lowest in energy, whereas as you increase this number right here, uh, you go higher and higher up in potential energy. Okay. So 
I mentioned that when we move this electron that I circled in yellow into the LUMO from the HOMO, that process was excitation. But here's the thing, is if you want to excite that electron, you have to have absorption. Okay, so absorption happens prior to excitation. Okay, so we have this process called absorption and literally what absorption is is it's the process of this molecule in this case it's formaldehyde it's the process of it absorbing that photon okay so this is absorption of a photon and it's absorption also of the energy that that photon brings with it okay so you know you can relate the wavelength of light to the energy by this equation energy is equal to Planck's constant 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds times the speed of light in a vacuum 2.9 and 8 times 10 to the 8th and then you divide that by the wavelength so you can relate uh, energy to wavelength in this way okay and it turns out that if you have lower wavelengths of light they'll correspond to higher energies because energy and wavelength are inversely proportional to one another okay but anyways you absorb the photon and the energy that comes with the photon, and that's ultimately what leads to this excitation. So under normal conditions, unless you're heating it up, uh, that electron will not be in the excited state. You have to absorb the photon and the energy, and then the electron will be promoted into the excited state, whether it be singlet or triplet. So now what it's time to do is to look at this really important diagram um, that diagrams the very important processes, the important quantum mechanical processes that occur um, going between ground state and excited states. Okay, and really what we're concerned about here, we're concerned about this S sub 2, we're concerned about this S sub 1 energy state, and then down here, S sub 0, this represents the ground energy state. Okay, now like I mentioned initially, you know, what we essentially have to do is we basically have to take our molecule, whatever it is, and expose it to light. For example, it could be ultraviolet light. And then what's going to happen is notice, notice that, you know, for example, I have this right here. I'll kind of bold it so you can see it. Um, essentially what's going to happen is the electron will get raised in energy, right? The electron goes up in energy and it goes into an excited state. And maybe it goes into the S sub 2 excited state, okay? So it's in the excited state now. And we're going to see how internal conversion works, but what can essentially happen is, is you can go up into one of these excited states. Maybe it goes into this one. Maybe it goes into this one of the S2 energy. Okay. But what's essentially going to happen is you're going to get some vibrational relaxations. So here's some relaxations, vibrational relaxations as you go down to the lowest possible S sub 2 energy. Okay, and when you get to that point, then you can do this process known as internal conversion. Okay, and here's where we go back to our definition of internal conversion. It's a radiationless transition between states with the same spin quantum number. Well, these guys right here, S sub 0, S sub 1, S sub 2, these all have the same spin quantum number that's denoted by this S right here, right? If it was T, they would be different spin quantum numbers, right? Okay, T is for the triplet state, right? But they have, but this S sub 2 and this S sub 1, they have the same spin quantum numbers. And so this process of going from the S sub 2 energy state to the S sub 1 over here, this process is called internal conversion. And it doesn't release any photons. So fluorescence, as we talked about in a previous video, this process releases photons. So this, you get a release, release of photons. But it turns out that that's not what happens in the case of internal conversion. In internal conversion, you don't get release of any photons, okay? In fact, the only thing that gets released is heat. And whenever you have this vibrational relaxation right here, you get release of heat. And that's a very important implication in biochemistry because as we'll see, things like melanin, which absorb UV light from the sun, uh, they don't fluoresce at all. So there's no fluorescence that occurs with melanin. Um, that would be dangerous if it did because you don't want photons getting released inside your body. So what ends up happening is whenever melanin absorbs the light, it goes up in energy. The electrons go up in energy and you get vibrational relaxation, with, which dissipates that energy of the photon in the form of heat. But let's say, for example, let's say you're in this state right here. 
let's say you start off in this state. So you'll see that the same thing's going to happen. But let's say you start off in this state right here. Well, what can end up happening is you can get more vibrational relaxation. So let's say, for example, that you know you started off in the ground state, right? You started off in the ground state, and I'll do this in orange again. You start off in the ground state, and you know you start off in the ground state, and you go up in energy, right? And then you get up to this point, right? So you're at this energy right now, which has um, a spin quantum number of s sub one. And then what's going to happen once again, just like we saw before, is you're going to get this vibrational relaxation. And you're going to relax back down to this point right here, which is the lowest possible energy of S sub 1. Okay, And this process of the vibrational relaxation, this is what produces heat. Okay, So whenever you do vibrational relaxation, you get energy lost as heat. Okay. Now, once again, just like I showed you before, you know, when we went from S sub 2 to S sub 1, I can go from S sub 1 down to S sub 0, the ground state, using internal conversion. Okay, so let me do that. So I can use this process right here. This is basically the same thing, although it looks a little bit different on the diagram, but it is the same thing. I'm going from S sub 1 to S sub 0, and this process is internal conversion. Okay, this is internal conversion. And so I'm going down to this ground state, and then from there, I can do more vibrational relaxation, right? And that get down to the lowest possible energy attainable in that molecule. And during this vibrational relaxation, I get release of heat, okay? So what can essentially happen when you absorb this photon, it doesn't really matter if you go into the S sub 2 or S sub 1, what ends up happening is if you truly are going to do internal conversion and not release a photon like fluorescence would, if you're not doing fluorescence, you'll do some vibrational relaxation to get down to a lower energy state, and that vibrational relaxation produces heat. And then you can have internal conversion, which takes you between two states, like S sub 1 to S sub 0, that have the same spin quantum number. Okay? If you change the spin quantum number, that would be something different. That's inner system crossing, and we're not concerned about that. Okay? Inter inner system crossing is when you go between two states that have different spin quantum numbers, as denoted by the S and T. But that's not what we're talking about in this video. We're talking about going between two states that have the same spin quantum number, like S sub 1 and S sub 0. So when you do the vibrational relaxation, you get energy dissipated as heat, and then internal conversion just takes you between two points that have the same spin quantum number. And then that energy is transferred into the molecule to create, you know, increases in kinetic energy. It starts vibrating and so forth. And then the energy is dissipated as heat. Okay. And th the way that this has a large range of applications is that, uh, and you can go watch the videos on melanin. Uh, melanin is a, is a polymer that exists in your skin, and certain people have more melanin than others. But basically, it's designed to protect the underlying DNA in the tissues that lie underneath the skin. Okay, Because here's the thing, if you end up with UV light striking things like DNA, so let's imagine this formaldehyde, maybe it's not formaldehyde, we're talking about DNA or something. Well, if light was to strike the DNA, okay, what would end up happening is potentially you could get excitation of an electron into an excited state. And what that actually does in the case of DNA bases, like the nitrogenous bases, like thymine especially, is it causes formation of free radicals. And free radicals, I can't emphasize this enough, are things that you really want to avoid in biochemistry. You definitely want to avoid free radicals because it causes mutation, cancer, and death. You don't want that stuff. So the genius in having melanin is melanin sort of takes the bullet if you consider the bullet as being UV light. So the melanin exists superficial to, um, to the DNA, and so the melanin gets hit by the UV light, and the melanin undergoes this internal conversion right here. So the melanin will undergo internal conversion and vibrational relaxation, and all of the energy of the UV light photon that hit the melanin is dissipated as heat. So I can't emphasize how important that is. The genius in the design of melanin is that you dissipate the energy of the photon as heat. That is the genius in the design. And if that wasn't enough, you actually have some extra protection in your body from UV light. 
one of the ways that DNA design is a genius is the DNA basis, which if you're familiar with biochemistry, you have adenine, thymine, guanosine, and cytosine. The genius in the design of these guys is, yes, they're more susceptible to forming free radicals than melanin, but these guys can also do internal conversion. Okay, so um, one thing I'll mention at this point is melanin's efficiency. So melanin's efficiency at catching the UV light is approximately 99.9%, .9%, which means that only about 0.1% of the UV light actually gets to the DNA. Okay, but if it gets to the DNA, the genius is that these guys right here, these, these DNA bases, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, they can also do internal conversion. So there's no guarantee that they do form free radicals if they get struck by UV light, but they do have sort of a defense of their own. It's that they, they can do internal conversion as well. Okay. So hopefully as this video gave you a little bit of intu intuition on what internal conversion is and maybe some of the applications of it. In the next video, we're going to talk about inter-system crossing and phosphorescence. See you in the next video.